So many blessings, Miss Penny Pierce. Hi. <laughs> you got you uh you got a haircut from the last time we met. That's right. I blessed in the at the end of the year. I cut about ten inches off of my hair, <laughs> and now it's curly, kind of slightly yeah. curly. So we'll we'll see what what it what goes on with what lightening up. With yeah, yeah. So. So how has life been for you? I, I was just um, reviewing the, your 2022 Oracle letter again. And um, it, just the opening paragraph alone speaks volumes to my life, you know, and, and I know it resonates with, with so many other voices out there as well. Um, like, how, how do you know? How, how do you know this is, this is the vibration of, of what's going on? with people before we get into our discussion of of some of the topics I want to get into. But like, how do you feel and know this resonation of of what's going on and with humanity? Gosh, I that's hard to say exactly. I just I just tune into what I sense is going on with the energy at a larger, higher frequency or level or expansive sense of my you know how i have my sphere and i expand it and contract it you know and so when i expand it i get a sense of um trends and uh you know other things but also i just use like that first paragraph i believe is about uh time right it's about the kind of strange experiences of time we've been having lately um and often when I share my own experiences at a deep level, it, it parallels so many other people's, you know, like I'm just like being a barometer, you know, and, and sharing my point of view. So I don't know exactly how it, it all comes together, hmm. you know, so, um, and there are things I, I didn't put in that letter because they were a little political and I didn't want to alienate people or anything, but um you know, but yeah. try to be uh, a little more general in nature. <laughs> yeah, people are people are very, very politically sensitive. Right They're now. hair trigger. Yeah, a lot of them right now. Yeah, so it's but but, you know, just speaking on the time itself, you know, when 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 reading that and, and just pondering upon it for a second, because it, it's it's a direct reflection to my life and, and what's going on now. Of course, you've been, th you know, with me through. A, a lot of what's been going on and, and I was able yeah. to leave that situation that I was in. Mm -hmm. And even though I left one tumultuous situation and stepped into another, the, the tumultuous situation I'm in now is more of a, of a sense of um, things that I know that I can handle that are in my control. Whereas the one that I left wasn't, and it was, um, it was detrimental to my thought process, my mm -hmm. clarity. Mm. You know, so this is this is the difference. And it's just understanding each situation that I step in and, and where I'm at doesn't mean that it's easy or, or that it's it's flowing. But as long as my clarity is there, I know that I can handle almost any situation. But reflecting back onto the time aspect of it, I have no idea what day is what day, what month <laughs> is what month. I really don't. <laughs> Help me too. <laughs> and, the, and the reason why is because there's so much going on in my personal space and then in, in the environment around me that I, I lose track of time because my thought process is constantly on things that need to be done. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I have been th there last year. Um, you know, because my stepfather died around August, beginning of August, which mm -hmm. threw me into all this stuff with bureaucracy and selling furniture and, you know, all kinds of stuff. Materialism, and, yeah. Yeah, yeah, 3D uh, <laughs> details. And when that kind of thing is pressuring you, you, you lose track of um, any kind of like rhythmic nature of time and you you know, but then it kind of evened out at the end of the year. And then I had more blank space. And then that stretches out and then you don't know what day it is either. <laughs> it's right. just, yeah. Uh, but I'm not so in need of 
having to know that anymore either. Do you know, like, I don't have to know exactly what's happening, although I have it on my calendar to remind me, but, but in my head, I don't keep it all that way anymore. You know, I used to. Yeah. So why, why is, and I know this is going to sound silly up front, but why is time so important to track to the second you know, why should we be so conscious of time? Honestly, I, I don't know, because for me, it's the change of consciousness is that so much of time is just being swallowed up in the present moment. You know, it's not like I don't really feel like I have a separate past or a separate future. In fact, I don't really like using the word future anymore. I use the word potential realities. There's millions of ways that I could change my frequency and have another reality materialize now, in the now, you know, and my past, I figure they're all moments in my, in my now. Also, they're little bubble realities that I can project into and go back into them if I want, but they could just belong to everyone or anyone. Why are they mine alone? So in terms of keeping track of time, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it keeps you in that linear framework, I think, which I don't really care to be in too much anymore. I'm trying well, I guess... to, you know, work with this sense of, yes, using my left brain to make good choices and, and produce things and do things in the physical world, but let go of a lot of the the older ways that the left brain was trying to organize my reality. If that makes sense. You know? Yeah. Well, no, it does because it's like, for me, time is just time is important to me personally, because I know is limited, you know, and, and I've wasted a lot of my time. Um, ignorant you know, just to sleep to many things. And, and, and now I feel such a pressure on me because I know that my body's changing and I can feel it. You know what I mean? And it's, <laughs> there's so much that I want to do and try to get done now. So this is a lot of the pressure that is on me now to where time escapes me, you know, and, and, um, and there's not enough of it, you know, and which is now starting to play into my sleep quality, my my overall daily functioning, you know, because when you say there's not enough of it, that's just a left brain projection, mm. because what you have is an unlimited present moment. And then it just keeps morphing into it's like a new movie every, you know, every time you focus on it. And it's not out ahead of you so much. It's I think that. When you stay in the moment and really live it fully, um, you probably extend your lifespan or you do whatever the soul wants to do. You know, I don't know if some people are sort of destined to like I always think of um, John Denver, you know, and um, and how he died, you know, really to me prematurely. But his his death was a, a real symbolic act, you know, and. And it's very important, I think. I'm not familiar it's, with the sim symbolism behind it. I just know that he died crashing into a mountain in a plane. No, into the ocean. Into in, the ocean. It, yeah, yeah. But he had tried to go up on the Challenger rocket years before. He wanted to be one of those ones who went up into space. And he didn't get... He, he got replaced at the last minute by uh, Krista McAuliffe. And then, of course, it exploded the teacher, I you watched know, that live with my own eyes. Yeah, me too. Um, shocking. And and he wrote a beautiful song about that called Flying for Me. But um, I don't know how I got onto John Denver. But, <laughs> but no, but these, um, these are but, significant you know, moments, right? It is. Uh, sometimes I think people, some souls will use their death experience in order to give a teaching or a, a lesson or something to many people. Um, so. But otherwise, living in the present moment, I think, keeps you very conscious and, you know, and possibly keeps you from stressing as much. 
I believe that, Miss Penny. I've come to believe exactly <laughs> what it is that you say. And, and I think that helps me deal with a lot of um, just occurrences that has, has came in my life. And, and just understanding that people come into our lives to teach us certain lessons. You know what I mean? And whatever those lessons are or those experiences are, whether they're joy or, or extreme pain, right? There's, there's an experience and a lesson to learn in, in each one of those. So that really helped me from um, holding on and just able to, to let things go a little bit easier, just understanding, even in relationships. You know, sometimes you, you get into a relationship and, and this may be the moment you, you think that you find somebody for the rest of your life, but three or four years later, five years later, you can't wait to get away from this person. <laughs> and then you start to understand, well, maybe this person was just only supposed to be there for this moment. So let me take a step back and see what I've learned from these last four or five years. Mm -hmm. And is there anything to continue from there? If not, then, then I take my experience somewhere else and it's no, no harm, no foul, but yet emotions get in the way. Yeah. And, and it alters people's lives. Well, <clears throat> yeah. And eventually I think you make sense out of it. it. You know, if you, if you keep paying attention and don't stuff it, you know, down, but, um, there's usually a reason why experiences would tend to repeat, you know, because you, you got maybe part of the lesson and not all of it, and then it'll come back in a slightly different form. Mm. And then you'll understand. And that when I say lesson, I really mean, um, I think there are, we have various mistakes of perception where we misunderstand how the consciousness works or how spirit works or the universal laws work. And where we don't understand it fully, we're not in harmony. And then that's what materializes our experiences that mirror or uh, duplicate that m misunderstanding. So is that where the question comes from? Why Excuse does this? Oh, oh, salute, salute, mommy. <laughs> <laughs> but but the um like the question uh, why uh, why does this keep happening to me? You know, why does this keep happening to me over and over and over again? Because there's something there that you're not learning. Right. Yeah. You haven't understood fully where that um, mistake of perception lies, you know, and, oh, you know, sometimes it's something as simple like in relationships that if you don't please everybody, you're going to get rejected. And that comes from childhood, you know, like having to agree with your parents or else you're going to get, you know, hurt or rejected or abandoned or, you know, all, all those things. Um, and so then we try to fix our relationships, you know, or, or be obedient to them, to the other person in some way, or agree with them, even when we don't, you know, and, and then that's, you know, not a, a full understanding of, um, being able to be oneself and let the other person be themselves. Mm. Right. And, and, and if the other person is being themselves in a selfish way that where the heart isn't open all the way, then that's not a good match for you, you know? And finally you get it that, that you can't fix them or help them. And so, but you can love them, but you can't live with them necessarily yet because it'll slow you down too much. And then, okay, and, and now <clears throat> in that moment of, of awareness and, and, and realization, right, what, what is a person to do? Say this person is an, is an empath, you know, and, and they're dealing with a narcissist, you know, and, and this is just turned into some solar star sucking power that, that, that the, the empath is just left completely drained, you know, mm -hmm. how does a person like that get out of that situation where do they draw strength from when there's there's an entity sucking that strength from them well both people have uh this this need to have the to agree with the outside world or have the outside world agree with them 
you know, mm. there's the, the commonality going on there. But at some point, the empath has to say, because what the mistake empaths make is that they go out of themselves over into the other person and they feel into the other person and they don't feel themselves. It's like an either or situation. Mm -hmm. And that's because they see the outside world as separate from them. Okay. So if, if it's separate from you and the other person is separate from you, then you have to go over there. And meanwhile, you're not here. So you lose your sense of self when you're feeling somebody else all the time to make sure that you're safe or to make sure that you're in agreement or make sure that they're not going to attack you or abandon you, you know, and they're, you're on vigilant alert all the time as the empath. What the empath has to learn to do is stay in the center of themselves and let themselves feel with a larger mechanism where they don't leave their center where they just pick up information and are more neutral about it. And what are some tools? What are some tools that can be applied in that situation? Learning to center and also making a decision that, you know, I cannot uh, make this other person feel safe and happy by doing what they want. I have to do what's right for me. <clears throat> You know, there's that's a choice that has to be made at some point. And that comes cool. from, I guess, just awareness of how this individual is is doing exactly that to you, uh, providing himself or herself comfort in that fashion and using you to do that. So it's just putting your foot down in those moments and telling this individual, no, you do it. You know, I have things that I have to do or. Um, well, when you're dealing with narcissism, it's it's a tricky thing because narcissists basically they don't feel themselves either, unless they they have a big um, a, a broadcasting of who they want to be, and then they want the outside world to agree with that, because otherwise, if they don't get agreement, they go into panic and terror. So they have a, a million methodologies for getting people to agree with them, support them, make them feel wonderful. Because it's, a, it's a, you know, ego taken to the nth degree. And, right. so, and I, I surely believe that, M, that, excuse me, narcissists don't really know what love is. They think love means agreement. And they do not really have compassion. They have a need to dominate and to have things the way they want it to be. And if you don't agree with them, they go, they do a, a number of things. They try to charm you back. They'll, they'll um, blame you. They'll uh, go ballistic on you. They'll reject you without a backward glance, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you watch our past president and you see those behaviors like, <laughs> in spades, really, you know, it's, it's a lesson up in it. But well, you no see, if, a, if an empath says to a narcissist, uh, you do it, uh, they'll just get rejected, which will go into their pain. You know, so but somebody has to break the chain. And it's the empath who has to do it, really, I believe, because the narcissist is incapable of breaking through. The, 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 yeah, the empath is the conscious one. Right. Much more conscious. Yeah. You know, and 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 this is the thing. I mean, we have, as, as you mentioned with our ex-president, you know, we have narcissism. You know, America has has really turned into a narcissistic state. You know, uh, there is there is a lot of narcissistic traits in many, many people that I run across daily, whether it's just over talking a person or or just not even paying attention to what the person has to say blocking people shutting people down because you don't like what they there's just a lot of mm -hmm. narcissistic traits and and for me when people ask me what my definition of evil is you know and for me it's it's the pure narcissistic state for the definition that that you know how you defined it because there's there's no empathy <clears throat> it's complete manipulation there's no feeling there's no inward perspection. It's just mm -hmm. all, it's just all ego. It's just all 
that right. person. And right. what can be more evil than that? Because that's where pedophilia re- resides. And this is where murder sure. resides. And this is where yeah. some of our hu- most human depravities lie yeah. in narcissism. Well, it's because of fear at the core, you know, and often narcissists were abandoned early in life and they feel no one loves them. And so they have to do it all themselves. I'm going to take care of myself then and I'll be the great one. And, and often they are, you know, very charming, very successful, very sexy, very athletic, very, you know, everything, you know, and, and they cultivate that image to try to stay you know, what, you know, powerful, sane, safe, basically safe. Um, You know, but I think it's part of a larger thing, Thomas, that's going on on the planet now, which is um, ego death, which Mm -hmm. is, um, to me, the ego is identifying with your left brain, which is the part of the brain that defines things, categorizes things, and it, it experiences itself as separate from the rest of the world. And that's important because it enables it to have observations and definitions. It's where all the language resides, right? And so, um, but when you start identifying with the left brain and logic and all your rules and definitions and the way it should be and the way you can't do anything and don't rock the boat and, you know, all of it, it gets pretty tightly wound. And then there's no sense of being able to deal with surprise or uncertainty or open-mindedness and look at all the book banning that's happening right now. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. oh, no, we can't have an open mind because you don't know what would come into it, you know? <laughs> like, right. So we want to like control that. what's going into it. That's it. Yeah. And, um, you know, so um, so the ego death process right now, I think, is that we are we are raising up in frequency, which means that we are starting to move out of just that tight little way of thinking, which is very linear. Mm-hmm. into more of the right brain and the intuition. That's why I always talk about we're going into the intuition age out mm-hmm. of the information age, which is left brain. We're moving into the right brain, which is direct knowing. It doesn't have language. It just has immersion, you know, right, right. and it knows everything kind of all at once. And you're part of it all. And that's what's leading us into things like understanding collective consciousness and the unified field and, you know, these concepts. Uh, But the ego is so defined that, and if the world doesn't agree with it, that's the narcissism. Then it starts to go ballistic and go through all its, its methodologies to try to stay alive. And that's what's happening now with the large percentage of people in the world that are going into conspiracy theories or high levels of polarization, like I'm right, you're wrong, back and forth, you know, and then warlike behaviors that come out of that. Instead of just saying, well, hey, that's an interesting idea. And here's another interesting idea. There's not just two points of view. (laughs) There's a whole circular amount of points of view. Right. Right. Uh, And open up and take them in and find a synthesis of these things. But no, that's not the way the left brain operates. So what has happened is the left brain has has become the boss, right? The master. And it's trying to dictate how life runs because it thinks it has to be in control. Mm. It's all alone there doing it all by myself. Whereas the right brain has all the connection to the great resources of the, co- of the, the, collective, the collective consciousness, the group right. mind, the, all the beings, everything in the world. And all you have to do is ask. You don't have right. to use all this willpower. It's the doorway. The right brain yeah, is the doorway. Totally. And, and intuition brings you this stuff for free. You know, it's easy. But so, so but, what the, so, so what let me finish my thought here before I forget no, go, it, I'm sorry. is that that ego death is where we are starting to understand that that left brain being the boss is not correct. It's too much pressure for that part of the brain because it doesn't really know how to do that job. 
it's the implementer, it's the servant, it's the right brain and the soul that are the, the leaders and the boss. It brings us accurate information that's tied to all other information. And then the left brain says it, it makes it conscious, and then it helps implement it. And then it lets go and we go back and get more good stuff from the collective consciousness, bring it in, make it conscious, do it, let it go. But that's the new way of perceiving. So there are a lot of people, you know this, that are waking up now to mm -hmm. new perception and the new reality and, and tons of innovation that's coming out of that kind of way of, of perceiving the world. So that is not being slowed down. But there are a lot of other people that are getting much more polarized and stuck in a tighter kind of consciousness because they're being very defensive right now. And I, you know, the, I think the thing is, that how do we explain things so that it doesn't feel uh, threatening? It's not, it's actually going to make things easier and more fun, you know, so, but the ego, um, and I say this on a global level, it's not just in our country, it's everywhere right now where uh, dictators and, uh, you know, threatening war and doing all these things uh, are, and people who have, you know, money is like the big uh, dominating influence now. Mm -hmm. It's like, who has the most money, you know, that they're the leaders, you know, they're not necessarily good people. Well, exactly. And, and usually the people with, with all the money really aren't that good of people to begin with. <clears throat> but, well, I mean, oh, man, there, there was, there's, there's so many questions, you know, but so your left brain is, of course, what handles, you know, logic, uh, emotions, uh, decision making, things of that nature. It's, it's the yeah. worker. Yeah. And the right brain is the doorway that, that allows the worker to expand its business, let's say. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It brings you direct knowledge of whatever you need. The marketer, <laughs> you know, the marketing agent. But would, would, would the pineal gland, would that come from the right brain then? Yes. I, I, I don't know if you want to divide it down the middle, but the pineal gland is often considered pineal. to be a... Uh, you can pronounce it any way you want, but it, it comes from the idea that it's shaped like a pine cone, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so, uh, but it seems to be seen as the center of the soul in the body or this, the center of the mind and consciousness, higher consciousness in the, in the body. Some, you know, of course, some people say it's the third eye, but I think of it as like a white hole in the middle of our brain that lets the soul pour through. And when you open that up, you have that direct connection, you know? So it's very tied, I think, to the right brain. I think it's tied to the heart. And I think it's tied to our field of energy around us, mm -hmm. you know, that that's conscious too, right? It's like a part of our brain. Well, I could understand that because that's our field around us is, is information. <clears throat> it's it's information that we're gathering and processing for the left brain the worker to be able to utilize as tools mm -hmm. so but in this current state that we're in and and as you you've explained it we're living in a left brain mentality and, and we have been right as as you've exp explained and, and in that how much of our 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 pineal gland have we deteriorated you know, and, and has this been an attack on that gland? You know what I mean? As far as to keep us in our emotional state, to keep us distracted, to keep us out of this consciousness, you know, and just performing as robots so that we're not conscious to this, to the, to the atrocities that are going on around us. Uh, I've heard that, that there are some, some people say that the pineal gland can become more hardened, you know, but I think maybe it's just not activated, you know, that, that other parts of the brain are being used like the amygdala, which is the fear-based place that sends out the signals. That thing for, is huge and strong. 
yeah, fight or flight stuff that gets to the solar plexus and all that. But um, uh, I think if you meditate and focus on that part of your brain and just put attention in there, it activates it basically. Which secretes a hormone. It actually secretes. Oh, its yeah, it's own, the master its gland, the pituitary and the pineal together. They're right together there. And they act as the master glands for all the other endocrine glands. Right. So you get those tuned up and you tune up the rest of the, the body. So in a, in a daily sense, how, do, how would we know physically that we've, we've, um, we've tapped into that? What, what kind of sensations do we get? I suppose it's a, different a bit for, for different people, but I think it's a sense of clarity, really. Of, would it be uh, would it be like when we say that we're in the zone like man i don't know where that came from but i was just yeah. in the zone and mm -hmm. like everything was just clicking and i was perfect and it was just like right. i was a machine mm -hmm. right you're just in tune with self right and um or like when i'm writing suddenly i just get a kind of people say they get a download well it's like something starts coming through that i didn't personally know beforehand and mm. And it just starts to show up because I think we're in tune with what would you call it? Your soul group or higher uh, groups of beings. And when you're in tune with them, you're with them. You know, <laughs> you're you share knowledge with them. Mm -hmm. and, Absolutely. And then you you have that knowledge and you didn't know you had it before because you weren't consciously tuning in. You know, so yeah, it increases your level of consciousness or your inventive, creative nature. Um, like you said, um, even if athletic abilities or just ability to have the mind and body be totally, you know, one unit and working together in sync, you know, yeah, harmoniously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, here, here again, you, you sent me an email and was asking about what the topic was. <laughs> you know, and this is why I mean, this is why, because it's just we never know where we're going to go. You know, there's 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 just so much, so much to talk about and so much to resonate. A lot of my message to people is going back to, you know, what we were talking about, what was going on in the world and such. And, and you know, uh, just the, the, the different states of emotions and whatnot. And all I tell people, Miss Penny, my my message is stop focusing on what's going around you so much and start focusing on what's just going inside of you. And if every person was just conscious of self and their actions and what they were doing, all of these problems, most of them would just dissolve instantly. Right. Uh, I think too, the, the, the need to be right is something we could examine as well. Do you know, like nobody out there can really threaten you. Uh, you, know, you can be, you have the right to be yourself. Mm -hmm. You have the right to uh, be at whatever point in your evolutionary process you are at, you know, and then you, you have the right to move on from there and keep going. So, I think we just need to give ourselves the power to be and feel the way we want to feel. And that also then will bring in the idea that are we being um, ethical? Are we being generous, kind, compassionate? Are we practicing like the golden rule? And, and you know, because a lot of people, when they're feeling like they have to be right, they forget about those things mm -hmm. and then they get angry and frustrated and give their power away to something that they place outside of themselves. Right. Because the feeling of being right is rooted in ego. It's rooted in, 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 right. in pride. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I guess, I guess my thought process now, Ms. Penny is, is, um, I don't know anything, you know, and, and this is what I've subjected myself to. I don't know anything other than my experiences and nobody can tell me anything about my experiences because I experienced them. But outside of that, how can I be right about any of your experiences that you've, that you've ran across in your life? Mm -hmm. 
So when, when you're yeah. telling me something, even though that I may know it to be true from my experience, right. I have to take a step back and say, but this is a completely different person from me. They made different choices. They had different options. They had different tools to work with. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, yeah, I understand that. Like I said, I think earlier that, uh, we each experience certain truths individually, you know, in our own, with our own filter, but there are universal truths that we all do experience, you know, that are uh, commonalities with humanity, you know, love for our children or, you know, our dog or <laughs> cat or, or nature, uh, you know, loving to be near water or whatever, mountains or whatever, certain things in nature. Um, these things are, they bring us into harmony or into love. They open our hearts. You know, these are, are things that we might just experience it in with different surroundings or circumstances or reasons why we experience it. But it's still a common thing. So well, when you say that you can relate to what I'm saying, you know, I understand. Yeah, we can relate. We may have a different story around it, though, you know. Right. Well, that's that's, you know, generally speaking, you know, let's well, let's specifically speak on love. Right. And, and love of a child. So a mother's going to tell a child that she loves her child. Right. But love, again, is a relative term because because it's it's one's experiences and definitions thereof. But. I think there's a general truth, an absolute truth of what love is. It's just, again, our individual perceptions, you know, like a, 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 a drug addicted mother loves her child. She'll tell you that she loves her child. But I think her, her love for her child is rooted in, in, in how that child is, makes her feel. You know what I mean? It's, it's the love of dependency, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So, so that, that mother, you couldn't tell her, well, no, you don't love your child because to her dependency is love and you couldn't tell her any different. Right. Yeah. And that's, once she gets that and gets, gets to experience that, then she may evolve to the next level or frequency of love because love looks different at different frequencies. Yes. Amen. I remember once this woman decided to hypnotize me and she was trying to get me to feel love, you know, like, and I could tell that she, her idea of love was kind of romantic love or sort of a emotional love. And I had already gone out beyond that to a higher level. And for me, I said, but it means the perfect fit of how everything fits together, mm -hmm. you know, like it's perfect. Mm -hmm. And and she didn't get, you know, like I, so, and I, then well, I because realized. Because that's a lot of people's perceptions of love today is based upon perceptions that have been placed there through media, through watching soap operas as a child and, 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 and reading <laughs> right. romantic fiction novels and things. So these are people's perception of what love is supposed to look like. Right. Right. But they don't know it personally. Yeah. Yeah it's concepts and things like that. But when you have, you know, you know, people say love yourself. And you know, I think, how do you, you know, you can't really get outside yourself to love yourself, you know, coming back like that. You can only be love mm -hmm. it, you know, and then when you actually go into the experience of being the soul, which is made of love and spirit, then you have so much love that you don't need anymore. You know, <laughs> then you can just, oh, let's just play in it with other people. Let's just share it. Let's just create. See, I haven't gotten it. there yet. You know, <laughs> I, 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 I know that I love myself. I love who I am. I love my experiences. I love what I became into, you know, and I love the person that I'm, I am sitting here talking to you now. There's nothing, no experience in my past would I change because that would alter who I am now, mm. you know, and, and I love I love the fact of who I am and I, and I, and I believe that those experiences that I've went through were, was to create this being here with these experiences and able to, to relate to so many people that I am now, 
you know, mm-hmm. and, and helping so many people. And I find comfort in that. But I still need to feel compassion and love and wantedness from somebody. I'm still craving attention. I'm still mm-hmm. craving, you know, just affection. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know what to say about, about that exactly because <laughs> uh, uh, that's not right or wrong. It's, it's just kind of where you are. And I think that there are times where we all want connection. You know, we want, want similarity. We want belonging into that sense of us, people on our wavelength. Where right, you well, right. Feel- I just want to share with somebody. You know yeah. what I mean? I just want to yeah. share these experiences that I'm having, these epiphanies and, and things of that nature. This, yeah. Even though it's fulfilling for me, but I still just want I want to share. You know what I mean? I want to share mm-hmm. with somebody and somebody to, to see me. And, and so but I mean, is that natural or, or is that is that a downfall? Is that? No, oh, I think it's natural. No, I think it's absolutely natural. And. Uh, uh, and it's part of our human life. I think also being alone and on your own and quiet and and being, because I have been for some years uh, also, especially when I was younger, growing growing into my spirituality, especially as a woman. Um, mm. I think women need to be separate for a while to build up their inner strength and feel who they really are. Um, And, but there's a real peacefulness in that. There's a beauty in that of feeling that sense of your own perception and your presence just being fine, you know, and then as you expand it out, then you relating to furniture, nature, trees, sky, you know, then everything becomes kind of part of you. That's the way. I've experienced it. It's a very mystical kind of thing almost. And then it doesn't preclude, you know, uh, being with people and enjoying them a lot and laughing or sharing stories back and forth or, you know, being affectionate. You're right. No, you're you know? right. Because I find comfort in my comfort is, is being outside, being in the element, being in the environment. I sit outside, Miss Penny, I'll tell you, 10, 12 hours a day. It's hard to get me to come in the house because I am... <laughs> I'm comfortable just hearing birds and just hearing cars go by, just hearing the element of life mm-hmm. is, is what soothes me and, and comforts me. And, and in those moments, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm comfortable with self. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just, you know, rotates, you know, it's like uh, a, like a, <clears throat> a kaleidoscope, right. You know, you get mm-hmm. different views and then they keep rotating and sometimes you get the quiet one and then the, the, busy one with people and, but there's no one right way. Right. And I think we get stuck in that. I get, I think we get stuck in thinking that there's a right way because (laughs) we're going to be back to being right again. (laughs) Right. There you go. The the, the hamster wheel. (laughs) Well, Miss Penny, thank you so much again for, for um, collaborating with me. I love having you on the show, man. I really do. Oh, it's always fun. We always talk about some really interesting things. That's, that's just, that's just where my mind goes. You know, I have so many (laughs) questions as to how this thing operates inside my brain, you know, inside my skull, you know, is, is just my thoughts and I can really go into dark places, you know, and, and I Mm -hmm. notice myself getting into very, very dark places places because of the pain that that still resides within me Mm. you know the pain of abandonment the pain of of you know just uh the atrocities that we do to one another you know i've seen these things firsthand and when you see them you can't unsee them you know so i know it, it it's part of the empath's path i guess is that when you when you see that or when you feel your own pain, you realize that that was pain that almost was handed down to you from the person like a perpetrator or someone else who was in a similar or worse pain, mm-hmm. you know, and that if you hold it in yourself, it validates it back to that other person. Mm-hmm. If you release it, 
and say, well, I don't, why am I making this so real for myself? Because when you hold something and keep your attention on it, even kind of unconsciously, even if it's through resistance, which is still giving things attention, um, it stays there in your field and then it keeps creating a reality that has that particular frequency in it. But if you, you know, I almost feel like you have to kind of get bored with these things or say, do, am I the only one in the world who owns this kind of pain? <laughs> you know, yeah. no, it's a human thing. It, we're share, we share it. Let, let it go out into the field. Right. And then change your frequency inside your own body to what I call your home frequency. Right. And, and you're not made up of, um, you're not you because you had pain. Do you know? It's you are you because you're you. <laughs> right. You know, and sometimes what we do is we come in and clear karma in the early part of the life. And someone told me once that a lot of times spiritual teachers you know, because they, they've cleared pain out of themselves. And when they're in the non-physical realm, they're, you know, in a high state, and they come back into the body for another life. And they have to be reminded what other people are feeling. So empathically, you can relate to other people's suffering. So you will go through things often in your childhood as a spiritual teacher or example, a spiritual example, maybe, um, that puts you back into that framework of mind. It's like, oh, that's what it's like to be in fear and to be suffering and to be sacrificial and all that stuff, you know. And, uh, and then as you grow up and mature, you go, oh, wait a minute, that's not even real. You know, that's not the way I think. Mm -hmm. And then right. you shed that. But now you remember how what other people are going through so that you can really work with them and help them, you know? So, so what you are now is because of what you actually are, you know? So, and that's true for everyone. What you I know, am now as, is, you, as is we because grow, I am actually who you're, that, you're being your soul more and more and more. Mm. And just shedding that old stuff that we really is kind of a lie. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. you spot, you spot on, Miss Penny. So <laughs> that these are why it, I enjoy these conversations. Because when I leave, <clears throat> I leave these conversations, Miss Penny, with with such clarity. Of you, as you're just a beacon. You know, you're you are you're a beacon of light for me, at least. You know, and and it's just it's just correction. You know. Um, so, Sometimes so I it's just like these. tweak the view a little bit, you know. Well, because uh, you know, a little because, uh, one degree, and everything could change. Well, it's because it's because the element of work that I'm in, I deal with a lot of unconsciousness, and I deal with a lot of emotions. I deal with a lot of, um, you know, just just uh, lost lost individuals, you know. And and I have several beacons. I have you. I have a couple friends. I have. Mm -hmm. You know, I have people that I can raise my consciousness back up, as you say, get back into kind of that home frequency. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, mm. Because yeah. because without them, you being you being one of them, without these type of conversations, I could easily just get caught back up into, you know, just being right. being asleep, as you say, getting caught up in these conspiracy theories and, and things of that nature. When you're in that environment. And it seems like it's everything that's all around you. You can get lost in that because everywhere mm -hmm. you're looking is this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and that goes back to the early talk about empaths and narcissists. I think that, that you have to make the choice to take care of yourself and not to please the others. And also the other thing I did say is sometimes you just have to leave the narcissists. You have to get out of that force field and into one where you're around other people who are much more on your new wavelength so that you can strengthen your integration mm -hmm. of that self, that true self. If you keep dipping back into a field uh, where people are on the lower level or, or 
not, well, I don't mean that good or bad, but, um, right. you know, j- just um, more emotional maybe, or, or astral plane kind of vibe. Uh, it, and if you're relating to them or trying to, re- then you have to lower your frequency to connect. Right. Rather than keeping your vibration up a little higher and letting them take notice of you and the ones who are ready will, will shift over and start to, they call, what did he learn? How did he get to be so, you know, free and so forth, you know? Right. Well, and that's what I had to do. I had to get up from under that pressure. I had to get out of that so I could just actually have, again, like we said earlier, the clarity just to think about what was happening and what was going (laughs) on. And when I was able to do that, it was just a, 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 a tsunami of information and red flags that let you know that this is, this is what I was in the presence of, mm-hmm. you know? And, yeah. but so if, if, uh, again, if, if anybody out there is in any of these types of relationships, you know, um, it's, it's just one, I think understanding first and foremost, who the narcissist is, you know, is it, is it me, which I, I, <laughs> <laughs> a narcissist can't a, a narcissist would never even think like that no so it's it's just understanding the situation getting away from it and 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 getting clarity of what the hell is going on before things occur yeah 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 Ms. so Penny, you uh, take care of yourself thank you i will <laughs> you, you stay healthy um thank you stay blessed and and uh I'll, we'll check back in maybe in another two, three months and see what, okay. what we got going on. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. Stay blessed. Stay healthy. All right. Stay happy. Okay. We'll do. Bye.